over today on the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. Special welcome if you're a visitor with us today. We welcome those who are worshiping in person and those who are worshiping with us online. Today's service will follow the service of word that begins on page 38. We'll turn to that liturgy after the opening hymn has been sung, which we will sing after the bells have been rung. Our today's service reminds us that our salvation, as we know, is free. But being a Christian is not. There is a cost to being a disciple of our Lord Jesus, and that cost is seen in the words of our readings today, and, and especially the gospel message from our Lord. But we'll begin our service then with the ring of the bells, and then join to sing the opening hymn, hymn 466. Amen. 
In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
readings from the book of James. This morning we read selected verses from chapter 2. My brothers, have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ without showing favoritism. For example, suppose a man enters your worship assembly wearing gold rings and fine clothing, and a poor man also enters wearing filthy clothing. If you look with favor on the man wearing fine clothing and say, sit here in this good place, but you tell the poor man, stand over there, or sit down here at my feet, have you not made a distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil opinions? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? However, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show favoritism, you are committing a sin, since you are convicted by this law as transgressors. In fact, whoever keeps the whole law but stumbles in one point has become guilty of breaking all of it. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith but has no works? Such faith cannot save him, can it? If a brother or sister needs clothes and lacks daily food and one of you tells them, go in peace, keep warm and eat well, but does not give them what their body needs, what good is it? So also such faith, if it is alone and has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. This ends the epistle lesson. Hallelujah. Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Hallelujah.
will surround Jerusalem, so our Lord's love surrounds his people both now and forevermore. Amen. For consideration this morning, we turn our attention back to the epistle of James, the second chapter, verses 14 to 18. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith but has no works? Such faith cannot save him, can it? If a brother or sister needs clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you tells them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does not give them what their body needs, what good is it? So also, such faith, if it is alone and has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. This is the word of God. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, our Lord, milk is good for us, and it tastes good. Cookies taste good, and maybe good for us. Milk and cookies together taste great, and there's got to be some nutritional value in there somewhere. They just are two things that seem to go better together. A nice, tall, cold, tall, cold glass of milk and a, a warm, gooey chocolate chip cookie. It's a great combination. A cookie that's not so gooey, maybe been around a little while, can come in nice and handy when that milk is there. You can dunk the cookie in, soften it up. Great flavor. Milk and cookies are good. Milk and cookies are better when they're put together. Faith is good. Faith is necessary. Works can be good. Faith and works are better together. What is faith? The Bible defines faith as being sure of what we hope for and convinced of that which we do not see. Faith is believing in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, a Jesus whom we've never seen, whom we've heard about, whom we are convinced has done everything necessary for salvation. How can one have faith? Scripture tells us that it is God who gives faith. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. This, not from yourself, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. And the Bible tells us the means that God uses to give us faith is not something magical or mystical. It is a simple gospel. Faith comes from hearing the message. The message is heard through the word of Christ. The Bible tells us that faith is absolutely essential. It says without faith it is impossible to please God. The person who does all kinds of nice things for their fellow human being but has no faith in Jesus as his or her Savior, that's wonderful what they do for humanity. It does not please God in the least. And God is not impressed. And that person is not saved because that person has no faith. Faith is the essential element to one's salvation. Without it, we have no hope of heaven. Faith is the acknowledgement that everything God says about us and about himself is true. Faith is the implicit and explicit trust that everything necessary for our salvation has been done by Jesus himself and that we simply receive it as a gift from God. Faith is one of those abstract theological things we can't see it. It's in the heart. It's given to us by God, but you couldn't put your finger on it. It won't show up on an x-ray. But it is absolutely essential. And of course, the object of our faith is absolutely essential and important too. We can have faith in many things, but that doesn't mean that it's well-placed trust. I might have faith in my own abilities to do things, but experience teaches me, or should anyway, that I'm incapable of doing the things I think I can. My faith for salvation needs to rest upon Jesus, the only source of salvation, as he said through the Apostle Paul. Our faith is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself is the cornerstone of that foundation. And everything that he taught is necessary. That's 
what one's faith is. And James does not deny that. He doesn't dispute that. He doesn't try to present an alternative to that. He says that's simply the way it is. Our faith is that explicit and implicit trust that everything necessary for my salvation Jesus has done. And man, does that make life easier. I don't have to get up and worry how many good things I'm going to do today to make God love me. Because God loves me in Christ. I don't have to lose a lot of sleep at night over all the bad things I've done in the past or the good things that I failed to do because all of those sins have been taken away from me by Jesus Christ and God says so. Faith simply receives that promise that God gives us that all of our sins are gone. As far as the East is from the West, He has removed our transgressions from us. That's a wonderful thing. To have that faith, to know that there's nothing I have to do to earn God's favor, makes life a lot easier, doesn't it? Because otherwise, how would we know if we've done enough? How would we know if our scorecard balances out? Because we have done some bad things, we'll have to admit that. I mean, honesty just compels us to do that. So I suppose I'd better get busy and offset those bad things with some good things. But how do I know when the scales are even? They never will be, if it's up to me. But faith tells me it's not up to me that Christ did it, so the scales tip decidedly in my favor, and I am forgiven. But James tells us that that faith is never going to be all by itself. As Lutherans, we're familiar with the phrase sola fide, by faith alone. Through faith alone. We are saved through faith alone. The fact is, faith is never alone. Faith is always going to be followed by good works. And that's what James encourages his readers to realize. That faith is what saves. Faith alone is what receives every blessing of God. And that faith is never going to be all by itself. Because where there is faith, there will be good works. Think of your family, for example. Where there is love, there will be evidence of that. The mom and dad who have a love for their child or for their children will provide for the kids, correct the kids, instruct the children, give them whatever is necessary, maybe more than they need out of love for them. The young man who has his heart set on that specific young lady that he is going to try and woo her and win her affections, he will do whatever is necessary. He'll bring her flowers, he'll go to things she enjoys going to, um, and do things for her. Faith in Jesus as my Savior, faith in the promises that God gives, will show itself in the life of the person who possesses such faith. That's what James says. <clears throat> faith without works is dead. It's not possible for there to be faith without works. And so those works will take any number of forms. If you enjoy milk and cookies, that's great. It doesn't matter what kind of cookie it is. And there's a bunch of different kinds of cookies out there. It could be chocolate chip, it could be peanut butter, it could be molasses, it could be sugar, it could be some combination thereof. It could be homemade, it could be store-bought. It could be white milk, chocolate milk, skim milk, whole milk, almond milk, for crying out loud. Where there is faith, which is of only one kind, there will be works which will be of almost an infinite number of kinds. And so my faith will show itself. If I am a Christian parent, my faith will show itself in that I am taking care of and providing for my family. However large the Lord has blessed me with a family, big or small or somewhere in between, I'm taking care of it. My faith will show itself in me taking care of changing the diaper of my child. It will show itself in when I go to work, I work faithfully for my employer, whether he's a nice guy or not so nice. My faith will show itself as I give of my energy, my time, my abilities, my offerings to various causes that are near and dear to my heart. Some of them perhaps very public, others perhaps known only to a few people. My faith will show itself when I live that faith. Now that's not always going to be easy. I mean, it, it's easy to love
love my kids, at least most of the time, because my kids love me, at least most of the time. It's not hard to work faithfully for my boss because every week or two weeks he gives me this piece of paper that has a bunch of numbers on it, and that means I get some money from him. But what about showing my faith in Christ by my Christian life? A pastor once said that becoming a Christian is the easiest thing there is because it's all the work of God. We don't do a single thing to become a Christian. God did everything. Being a Christian is the hardest thing you'll ever do, that same pastor said. Because being a Christian means living your faith, doing what Jesus said. If anyone wants to follow after him, there's going to be trouble and hardship. And some of the fruits of faith are going to be that I'm going to maintain my faith, even in the face of all kinds of criticism. That I'm going to live differently from the world in which I live. That when the world says, you know, it's okay to do this, I not, won't necessarily do that or this. Because my faith says, no, that's not okay. So when the world says it's fine to just chase after everything and live for yourself, no, my faith tells me I am to live for everyone else but me. God first, my neighbor second. Me, way down the list somewhere. The world tells us differently. Our sinful nature tells us differently. We need me time. Our nature tells us we got to have some me time. God's word never tells us anything about me time. He says to live for others. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Never does say anything about loving yourself. Faith shows itself in how I live. Now, our fruits, of course, will be as different as we are. It would not be accurate or fair for us to say that every person who confesses his or her faith in Jesus will be, therefore, bringing forth the exact same good works in the same uh, amount. Some of you, perhaps, are headed over to the other side of the river today for Apple Fest. Maybe you were there yesterday. You don't have to go to that side of the river. There's parts on this side that also have apple trees. And you know that as you look at the apple trees in the various orchards, you have all kinds of different apples. Different types of trees give you different kinds of apples. You can go to the store if that's where you feel the apple originated from. And in that bag, you can find, you know, Granny Smith and Red Delicious and Gala and any number of other apples. They're all apples, but they're all different. Christians produce good works. They're all done out of faith and love for God and for their fellow man, but they're all going to be different. And so what you do as a good work may look very much different from what your brother or your spouse or your child or your parents do as good works. Or what I do will look very vastly different perhaps from what you do. That's fine. They're all good works. They're just different because we're all different Christians in different situations. James doesn't tell us what our good fruits ought to, good works ought to be. He just simply says they should be there. They're the natural result of one's faith. Could you have milk without cookies? Oh, certainly. I do it all the time. Could you have cookies without milk? I suppose so. <clears throat> Substitute a cup of coffee, a cup of hot tea, whatever you want. But milk and cookies certainly do go well together. Could you have good works without faith? Well, then they wouldn't be good, at least not in the sight of God. They would benefit others, perhaps, and make you feel good about yourself, but that's it. They would do nothing else. Could you have faith without works? No, not really. Because where there is faith, there will be good works of some sort, to some degree. Because they're simply better together. And so as you and I confess our faith in Jesus as our Savior on a regular basis, not just in church, but in our daily lives, we will also then want to bring forth good works, which demonstrate that faith in our Savior on a daily basis. Because our faith is essential, and works are beneficial. By themselves, they're good, but they're better together. Amen.
please rise. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now join to confess the Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed on page 41. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing as the offering is brought forward. thus through all our days. Praise to God, immortal praise. Amen. Let us join to pray the responsive prayer of the church on page 42 in the front of the hymnal. Page 42. Tomorrow evening, we pray. 
Lord Jesus, your mercies are new every morning. We thank you for the grace by which you have sustained your servants, John and Ann Halverson, throughout the 28 years of their married life. We ask that you continue to fill their hearts with an unselfish love that reflects your sacrificial love for them, so that their love for each other may never grow weary. With every joy and sorrow that they share, bring them closer to each other and to you, their God and Lord. Encourage all husbands and wives as they seek to fulfill their marriage promises and bless all of our homes with your abiding peace. And Lord God, you created man and woman in your image and it pleased you to unite them in holy matrimony. You have greatly honored marriage by making it a symbol of the spiritual union between Christ and his bride, the Christian church. <laughs> Grant that Matthew and Ivy Schneider may reflect this perfect love and commitment in their marriage all the days of their lives. Make their home your temple. Make their marriage a testimony to others so that your name might be glorified. And Lord, you are the great physician of soul and body. You chasten and you heal. We pray that you would look with mercy upon your servants in their various illnesses. Glenn Lusky, as he continues to undergo tests to determine what exactly is the cause of the illnesses that he is experiencing. Darwin and Angie Klatt and many others who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. We thank you for the medical personnel that are able to tend to our various needs, and we pray that you would bless the means that they use to not only diagnose the illness, but then also to treat those illnesses. We pray for these individuals that in the coming days, weeks, and months, you would bless them not only with good physical health, but a continued spiritual strength always to place their hope and their confidence in you. Be with their families also during these times of uncertainty and anxiety, reminding them that no matter what might happen to their loved ones, they and all of us are always in your care and that you will work all things out for the good of your people. And Lord of life and love, we ask your blessing upon our ministries to those with special needs. When you walk this earth, you show tender compassion to all and turn no one away. Help us to reflect your gentle compassion as we strive to serve those who have special needs. In particular, we pray for our local Jesus Cares ministry. Give those who teach, those who learn, wisdom, ability, patience, and resources so that the good news might be communicated effectively to those who sit in the classroom, regardless of their circumstances. Encourage us with your promises that whatever we do for others, we do for you, and bring us at last to the sinless perfection of our eternal home with you in heaven. And we pray that you would now hear us as we bring you our private petitions. bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus our Lord and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn.
Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.